Hello, I'm John Stuart Gordon, and together with Patricia Kane, it is our pleasure to welcome you to American Furniture, Interpretation Through Reproduction, our latest in a series of e-study tours of the Yale University Art Gallery's Hume Furniture Study, located on Yale West Campus. This program is generously sponsored by the Martin A. Ryerson Lectureship Fund. It is being recorded and it will eventually join other programs on the Art Gallery's YouTube channel. There will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the program, but if something occurs to you earlier, feel free to ask any questions at any time using the Q&A feature, and we will address them at the end of the program. It is my pleasure to introduce our colleague, Eric Litke, the museum assistant in the Department of American Decorative Arts at the Art Gallery. He coordinates all the visits to the Hume Furniture Study, amongst many other things. Eric trained as an artist, and his interest in process and materials informs how he engages with Yale's historic collections. Eric will be leading a conversation with Bob Van Dyke, a man of many, many interests and talents. In 2000, Bob founded the Connecticut Valley School of Woodworking in Manchester, Connecticut. He is also a contributing editor to Fine Woodworking Magazine. For years, he has brought students and colleagues to the furniture study, and he is one of our most loyal users. Without further ado, I pass it over to Bob and Eric for American Furniture, Interpretation Through Reproduction. Um, hi, thanks for tuning in today. And uh, I'm Eric, and this is Bob. And we are sitting in the Art Gallery's Hume American Furniture Study Center out at Yale West Campus. And um, this uh, West Campus is right along I-95, about uh, five miles from downtown New Haven. Uh, so this space as a study center of the Art Gallery was established uh, downtown in 1959. And uh, more recently, we uh, completed a move out here to West Campus and opened out here uh, in much, uh, much larger purpose-built space here in uh, the fall of 2019. Um, and so out here now we have about 18,000 square feet on two levels. Uh, and in here we house about 1,300 uh, objects. So that's furniture, we have clocks, uh, we have contemporary wood turning and all kinds of wooden objects. Uh, and these are all things made in America for the American market. Um, probably about half of our collection here uh, comes from the Mabel Brady Garvin collection which arrived at Yale starting in 1930. Uh, and so one of our particular strengths here is uh, American furniture, really from the early colonial period till about the, the first quarter of the 19th century. Um, but we also have many, many objects um, from the rest of the 19th century and the 20th century right up to the present day. Um, we also have uh, historic tools and uh, various displays that among other things, uh, talk about and explore uh, the handcraft of furniture making, or as it's called, cabinet making, uh, particularly in uh, the era of craft production, uh, uh, which is before sort of the advent of industrial manufacturing in the 19th century. Um, and so really our goal here is to really foster um, for makers and for students and for scholars and the public at, at large, um, a real up close and personal engagement with our objects and our collections. Um, and hopefully really foster among other things, a real interest in uh, early American material culture and history, um, which will hopefully uh, stimulate people to go out and explore all the other sorts of um, collections and institutions uh, devoted to early American history that are in Connecticut and in New England and beyond. Um, so it's in that spirit that uh, we invited Bob to come here today to a place that he knows very well. Um, we always enjoy hosting his classes, uh, his class visits that he has here. And so Bob is going to unpack for us today um, a really fascinating and um, uh, sort of long form project that unfolded over years that he and other um, very experienced craftspeople and his students worked on for the Windsor Historical Society in Windsor, Connecticut. And um, so it was a project that made good use of the furniture study and the collections we have here. So thanks for coming, Bob, and uh, tell us a little more about the beginnings of the project. Well, thank you, Eric. 
Uh, yeah, it's been a, uh, it's been a, um, first of all, it's been a real pleasure to be able to come here uh, over the years and study stuff up close. Uh, it's been just a great resource. Uh, anyhow, so a number of years ago, uh, Christina Vita, who was the curator at the Windsor Historical Society uh, in Windsor, she contacted me and told me that they were reinterpreting the house uh, that they had, the Strong Howard House, uh, to what it would have been um, in the year 1810. Uh, and she had a, um, a uh, Captain Howard's uh, probate inventory from 1819 uh, to go on. And then she also uh, studied uh, about 60 other um, inventories uh, from around Connecticut, uh, similar income people, uh, just to see what would have been in the house because they didn't really have an exact, uh, an exact thing. Um, so the, the whole idea of it was that it was going to be interactive and being 1810, the stuff would have been new. So, um, you know, that was, they wanted interactive, so new furniture made and stuff that people could uh, sit on the chairs, they could open the drawers, they could do all sorts of stuff. They actually use the, uh, in the keeping room, they do uh, cooking and uh, have demonstrations and all. Uh, so it was really, really cool and a very different take. In my, in my view, it was a very different take. So it was a three year project uh, broken up into three different phases. Um, you know, and so the idea at what Christina asked me was, did I know any cabinet makers who might be interested in uh, being a part of this? Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, I know a whole bunch of them, including myself. Uh, but Will Neptune was the one that really came to mind, especially after Christina was talking about uh, Eliphalet Chapin. Uh, so Will is probably the probably the best furniture maker I know and certainly the best instructor I know. And also, a he's been studying Eliphala Chapin for well over 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Chapin was um, probably the top cabinet mate, one of the top cabinet makers in Connecticut in the late 18th century, uh, working right out of East Windsor, Connecticut. Um, you know, so it was just a natural uh, that we that we should um, you know, that I get Will involved in this. And I have to say, Will was the lead on all of the, um, all the projects that we did. Uh, you know, we measured things together and all that stuff. Um, but Will was the one that, that, you know, basically final decision on how things were made and dimensions and all that good stuff. Um, you know, so Christina had a, a job to do trying to put together uh, the the furniture that was going to be in this in this house, and basing based on the uh, the the inventory that she was working with, um, but it was also based on um, you know what local cabinet makers uh, would Captain Howard have used, Eliphala right. Chapin being right down the road in East Windsor, uh, and he was one of the upper income people in the in the uh, town. Okay, so that made sense that, uh, you know, that's who we would be going to. But the other thing, he had some more practical um, things to think about was what pieces can we measure and duplicate? Because they wanted things measured and duplicated exactly. Sure. Uh, so what can we, what, what's accessible? Uh, you know, right. what can we get to? And um, also um, permission. I mean, we had to have permission to to duplicate these yeah. things. You can't just go and uh, go and do this. Um, you know, so before we go any farther, it would probably be good to uh, take a look at the the video that we did. Uh, Eric and I were up there a couple of weeks ago and uh, took some video of the room so you can see what's going on.
Okay, <laughs> now we're going. <laughs> I love and here we technical are. difficulties. Okay, so yeah, so we're walking in the strong Howard house and we are walking into the parlor here. Um, and yeah, so it's outfitted with all this reproduction furniture and you can see that they, um, so it was a total project. So we're seeing all these candle sconces on the wall and looking glasses. These are all newly manufactured uh, yeah. accessories for the rooms, right? Yeah, Every, everything there was, uh, was new. Uh, I should mention the house itself was uh, renovated uh, quite extensively, uh, brought up to code, new, uh, new roof, all sorts of stuff. So it was done really, really well. Mm -hmm. So this is, then we're walking into the second room. This is the keeping room here. Uh, we see actually that would have been an early, that would have been an, an antique by that point. That's a 17th century or uh, very early 18th century style chest. And here's one of the, here's one of the tavern tables or butterfly tables we're going to look at again. Then we walk into the, um, so here's the dining room um, that I guess it wasn't originally uh, a dining room, but they expanded later, made that a purpose uh, function specific room, a dining room. Here's you give us a little peek of these uh, sort of two part dining tables in here. Yeah, this is two tables yeah. that were put together, and drop leaf tables. Yeah, and look how they completely outfitted the table with all these accessories. And then you walk off there into the uh, pretty small bed chamber, and you have to kind of <laughs> look through the uh, uh, tester bed over to the uh, maybe the star of the show or the house, this uh, Chapin style high chest. Good. So um, Tell us a little more about the project. Okay, so um, the way this whole thing started, uh, Christina uh, and Will and I met one night, and it was a it was a five hour meeting, uh, and we started out talking about what cabinet makers might be interested in doing this, uh, and then at one point I said, you know, I run a school, and why don't we make uh, some of these projects into classes? Mm -hmm. uh, and we all thought that was a great idea. And then one of us came up with the idea of not only classes, but what if some of the students wanted to make the project, but not have it in their home, but donate it to the, uh, to the museum instead. And we thought that was a fantastic idea. But also we said, you know, some people are going to go, why would I do that? Uh, and other people uh, would said, uh, yeah, where do I sign up? And that's exactly, exactly how it happened. Uh, you know, so it was, it was really cool. So we started out the project. Phase one was the um, Daniel Clay breakfast table uh, that you see here. Uh, that was based on um, the uh, example at the historic Deerfield. Uh, and we made one very similar to that one. Uh, and then there's the Chapin School tea table uh, here. And uh, that was uh, copied from one in the, the storage at the Connecticut Historical Society. Both of these pieces were made by students and that, that's, you know, the, those, are, uh, those are student made. It's kind of cool because, you know, the student can go, uh, you know, yeah, you want to go see my piece? It's up at the Windsor Historical <laughs> Society. Go check it out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, so that was the uh, that was the um, the first uh, the first phase, and then the moving on. Three years later, we were at the third phase, uh, and the third phase was a um, the uh, the joint chest here that Peter Follinsby did, uh, but we did that as a class also, and that came uh, that was already um, about a hundred years old. It had been, belonged to uh, Anne Strong's grandmother. Um, and then there was the trestle table there that we made, and that was based on one from the Wadsworth uh, collection, and I believe that was uh, around 1710. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so and they they work on that table every day, mm -hmm. uh, so it was really cool. So um, go to the next one, and then we have the tavern tables or butterfly tables. 
uh, and we made three of those. Uh, students made them and donated them to the, uh, to the Historical Society. Uh, and I should mention the donations, um, the Historical Society did reimburse the students for their, uh, you know, the cost of, uh, of the class when they, when they did it. Uh, you know, so that was nice. So it didn't cost them anything uh, other than a lot of work. So, so these tavern tables were already uh, old when uh, in the year 1810. So we had um, uh, Fallon and Wilkinson. Um, they did the finishing on it, and uh, and uh, they did a, just a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. So, so that's uh, that's that. So then we went on to um, the th the second phase. The second phase was the biggest part, uh, and that was you know the the Chapin. Uh, drop leaf tables and we made two of them and we studied the original uh the original one which was in the uh, the uh, wood memorial library in east windsor and we um studied that and that wood memorial library was cool because uh it's directly across the street from aaron chapin's house aaron chapin oh, yeah. was the nephew of eliphala chapin and aaron right. chapin apprentice with uh so it was kind of cool. We went walking over there uh, one day, hoping to feel the vibe of, uh, of a lithalit, you know, maybe we'd see a chisel or something that they had missed on the ground. Uh, so it was pretty cool. It was a lot of fun. Uh, so we did that. And then the biggest project and, you know, probably the pinnacle of the whole project was the, um, the uh, high chest. And the Chapin high chest, there's uh, four known uh, one's one at, at Winnetour, uh, two at the Wadsworth, and then one right behind me at the uh, furniture study. Uh, so Will and I spent at the at the Wadsworth. We spent at least 20, 24 hours uh, over a number of trips, um, measuring, studying, photographing. Uh, you know, both of theirs. Uh, and then we also spent seven or eight hours here uh, doing the the um, eye chest here and and comparing all of them. And it was amazing how close they were. I mean, it was incredible, mm -hmm. um, the similarities and just very, very small differences. Yeah. Uh, you know, so it was a, it was an amazing uh, project. Uh, and there you see uh, the one behind me. Now you can see that in the one that we made, there's no pediment. Uh, which kind of killed us because, um, you know, we really wanted to do the pediment, uh, yeah. but the the ha the uh, room didn't have the uh, the uh, uh, ceiling height for it. Yeah, it's clearly. Yeah. yeah. So so we um, we hemmed and hawed, and it was like, do we scale down the design so that it could go in there? And it was fine. that would look kind of funky, um, you know. So we just said, all right, we'll do it. Uh, Chapin did a number of uh, flat top high chests like this. Uh, you know, so we did that, but the students all made the full uh, with the cartouche, the pediment, the whole bit. And I should say, you know, I should mention we did um, when we did that class, we were hoping that we would get six students. You know, it was kind of like, ah, you know, we figured, OK, it's 14 weekends, one weekend a month. Um, for or one week in a month for 14, yeah, 14 weekends. So over a year, and we were like, are we going to get people to commit to that? Yeah. And you know, because that's a serious commitment and a lot of money. Uh, yeah, we tried to limit it to 12, and we actually ended up with 15 students plus the one that we made for uh, for uh, the his, for the historical society. And I should say, Will did the majority of the of the work on this case. I mean, I did some of the grunt work, but uh, he did he did all the all the important stuff, uh, you know. So, um, but it, you should have seen fifteen or sixteen cases. Um, the amount of pine that we had just for the drawers was incredible. Oh, yeah. I mean, the stack it was huge. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it was pretty cool, and um, you know, so that was it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there is uh, one more object that lives uh, next to that chest that you built for the bedroom uh, at the Strong Howard House that I, I want to uh, just find out a little more about. And <laughs> that is the close stool. Uh, 
Um, and, uh, and, and in that 1819 uh, probate inventory from when Captain Howard died, there is a closed stool, as it's called, uh, for $2 mentioned in that inventory. Uh, and there's your reproduction, there's your interpretation of one. It's, if anyone's not quite getting it, there's a chamber pot sitting inside that little thing. So uh, tell me a little bit about this. So, so this, was, um, this was a real resume builder for me. Uh, I had not made one before. I can't say I had even seen one up close. Uh, I had a couple pictures to work from. And, you know, that was really it. Didn't have a lot of guidance. You know, Christina wasn't exactly sure what she, exactly what she wanted. Uh, but, uh, you know, I ended up with this, made this. And um, it was pretty funny because uh, I think Christina was at the shop the night before I was supposed to bring it up. And she's looking at it and goes, Bob, there's no shelf in the bottom for the chamber pot to sit on. And I was like, um, was there supposed to be? <laughs> I just figured it would sit on the floor and because no, 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 you need a shelf in there. So that's what I did that night. I put a shelf in and uh, put that thing in. And it was, um, it's basically the most popular piece when the grade school kids come in uh, and check out the place. They're all over that, of course. So we finally, you know, after three years, uh, four years, really, uh, we finally finished the, um, the grand opening happened and it was great. There were at least 50, 60 people there. And, uh, you know, it was a lot of fun seeing all that stuff, seeing all those people. But it was also like for Will and me, it was just a bittersweet uh, moment because, yeah, we had finished it, but this had been such a huge part of our lives. Uh, and now it was done, and it was kind of like, all right, what do we do now? Yeah, I mean, it sounds you like know? that was a, even that alone was a once in a lifetime oh, yeah. opportunity um, yeah. for people making reproductive furniture and running yeah. a class. It was an uh, incredible opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so tell us, there was, luckily, there was a whole part two to this story. So tell yeah. us about that. So a couple of years later, uh, Christina Vita had moved on, she moved down to Richmond. Um, and the executive director, Christine Emmerich, who I should mention, I mean, she's the one that did all the fundraising uh, for this whole, the whole thing, and she was amazing. Uh, but she got in touch with me and said that they were, they were reinterpreting the Dr. Chafee house, which is just across the green from the Strong Howard house, uh, and they were going to redo the, the office, and they needed a couple, um, they needed a couple pieces of, uh, of furniture made. Uh, so why don't we take a look at the video and we can, uh, we can see what that's about. Okay. So we're walking into that doctor's office, which was in the L uh, on the right side in the image of the house we saw before. Aha, uh -huh. and that looks like uh, a lot like our chest on frame behind us with a nice new Windsor chair and um, again, it's very beautifully outfitted with other props in the room and that's your apothecary chest. Nice. So we started out, um, they needed uh, two Windsor chairs uh, and they were made by a guy named Andy Jack and uh, we copied uh, examples, one from the Connecticut Historical Society and one from the Stanley Whitman House in uh, Farmington. Uh, we did that and then we had the work table, which um, was made by Gil Tyler, and we copied that from the kitchen table at the Webb Dean Stevens uh, Museum in, uh, in Wethersfield. Uh, but then we have the, the, um, the desk on frame here, and this was the Chapin School desk on frame. Uh, and, you know, it was a really nice piece. And uh, Will and I had studied this, we measured it. Uh, and we did make a couple deviations. Um, we, uh, we did change the, the drawer layout. So rather than the original here, which has three drawers the same width, we um, made the, the center drawer wider, more in keeping with the, the layout on the high chest. Right. So just, we just felt it looked a little nicer. Yep. Uh, 
Um, and then we, uh, we made a little bit of a change in the fan also. Yeah, that's right. So on the left is, is uh, this very much more sculptural looking fan on your piece. And on the right is, uh, is kind of your more sort of uh, typical fan you'd expect on, on, you see a lot of times more rural 18th century furniture. So like that more standard fan is you're simply laying that out on a board. You know, you've cut your drawer front, and you're laying that out with a compass and you're simply carving out of the board with a gouge. But this one that you did, this very, this very undulating sculptural one, is that the same thing? Are you just carving that out from the solid to do that? Well, no one, um, no one, no, no one who knows is still alive. Um, so we don't really know. But Will is, Will is the carver. Will is uh, one of the top carvers in the country. He's amazing. Um, but he came up with the method here, um, which is really simple and makes complete total sense of um, taking the drawer front, mounting it on a faceplate on the lathe, and then uh, turning the recess uh, so that you have that undulation and it's perfectly symmetrical that way. Uh, and it works great. And then taking it off and doing the carving from there. Um, and it worked incredibly well. Yeah, here's actually maybe a better shot of giving you a sense of uh, the shape of that shell. Yeah, yeah you can beautiful. really see the depth of it. Yeah, so that's that's the drawer flipped upside down. And on that, you see, uh, so that's your typical, so that you see the drawer bottom there. And so that's your typical drawer bottom construction, right? You've got uh, the piece that goes down to these little feathered edges and they fit um, into a groove inside there, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I want to just now take a second and um, let's, um, I want to flip around um, our chest on frame we have here. And I just wanted to make a quick point about how this case on this is made. It's, uh, I don't know, it was kind of a discovery to me. I, um, you know, the vast majority of, you know, the late 18th century case furniture we have in here, it's, um, it, it, the way the case, the drawer back construction is, is uh, very different. It's, um, and we have case furniture in here from Boston, Salem, uh, Newport and virtually all those things are kind of um, consistent in how in basically how the back is made. You've got a pretty simple, here's your case side, you've got a very simple rabbit. Uh, the backboard goes into it and you use fasteners, nail them in. You don't have to, all you're doing is cutting the backboard down the sides, nail it in. It's pretty straightforward. That's kind of the standard way of doing it. So I was surprised when more recently, I was walking around here when that was in line, the high chest, and I noticed the way the back was made. And then I noticed again also on this kind of Hartford County um, chest on frame is that instead, the whole thing is made like a giant drawer flipped up on end. So now you've got your case side and you've got your, your backboard is, has, is, has to be feathered down to this and it fits into a groove. Uh, no fasteners are needed, and um, it's it's a, I guess it's a better way to make a case, right? It is it is better. It's not as common. I mean, it's not it's not uh, unique to uh, to Chapin, but it is not not as uh, it is a better way of working. Um, if nothing else, there's nothing limiting the uh, the expansion and contraction of the of the back. Uh, oh, well, you know, yeah. so um, right. you know this is. This is not cracked. You'll see uh, nailed in backs that are uh, split and you'll see that all the time. Uh, you know, so it's just a little bit better way of doing something. And Chapin, if he could do something better, a little bit harder, but better, he was always gonna opt right. for that. And is it, is it simply take more time to do it this way? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a little bit more work, uh, right. obviously, but, but it's worth it. Yeah. Um, so let's walk over to our path carry chest. And so, um, so Bob, I remember the day you came to the furniture study with Will Neptune, 
and your stated mission that day was you were going to look, you were going to come measure this uh, chest on frame and uh, take a lot of measurements and things. And you were telling me about this whole new project to do the Dr. Chafee house. And you said, well, so now we have to find a uh, Connecticut River Valley late 18th century doctor's apothecary chest. And I said, Bob, aisle four, down on the right. That's exactly that's exactly what happened, and we, um, you know, we had looked for a couple different ones uh, that just didn't didn't quite make it. You know, there were a couple different uh, different things that we studied, uh, and we looked at Will and I looked at this, and it was really fascinating because uh, if you look at it here, this this locks uh, and this locks the drawers. Okay, so that's where you put uh, the stuff that you didn't want to people to get to uh, and that was locked there uh, and then the um, the uppercase had the uh, the doors uh, which also locked uh, and it has the uh, the typical uh, bank of drawers there so it was a really uh, it was a it was a cool piece and we considered making it uh, but then we opted for uh, a little bit we the the in the in the um, office uh, have it, visitors would have a hard time seeing what was behind the doors and wouldn't be able to see uh, what was in, in the drawers behind this locked uh, flat here. Uh, so we ended up um, changing to uh, the piece that you'll see uh, you'll see on uh, on view here. Yeah. Back. So can we uh, go back to the slide, our last slide here, and. Uh... So there's the uh, there's the uh, the apothecary chest that we we ended up, uh, and you'll see it has you know has sixteen drawers, sixteen dovetail drawers here, uh, and then uh, but it has the glass doors here, so people can see into the uh, doors, and it locks, but you can see into the doors, and you can see the uh, reproduction medical equipment that they had in there. Right. And then if you open the drawers, there's all sorts of stuff in there. So it's really, really a nice, uh, it's a pretty piece. Yeah. Uh, and it was a lot of fun, a yeah. lot of fun doing it. Yeah. And that's made out of cherry. As yeah, that's well as all, this. that's all cherry. Yeah. And so that's, that's uh, those what. drawers, the drawer fronts, that's all one board. Uh, all the, one board made all those drawer fronts. Oh, nice. So yeah. it all matches. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, and so, I want to just uh, pull our pallet jack in here, and um, I also want to. The great thing about this new space is all our case furniture is all on individual pallets here, so it makes getting around these things uh, quite simple. And this is the cool thing that you know you can, Eric can pull a piece out, and you want to see it closer. You want to see the back. Not an issue. And here it is again, the same uh, drawer back yeah. construction here on, on both cases. Um, I, I got to check once more. I think these are the only three pieces of case furniture in, in here, I think, that has that here. And um, so you see this kind of texture here. All this is all the scalloping from the, uh, the hand jack planing, the rough planing of these boards and things. So d does, your, does your piece that you made, uh, is that all? Is that all uh, rough plane by hand? All uh, the back that we did on that apothecary chest, because you can see it through the uh, through the glass, uh, we actually did cherry uh, and uh, it was shiplap. Okay. So a number of um, oh, that's narrow right. pieces shiplap, uh, and it, it looks it looks great. Uh, but this was a very typical uh, typical typical construction. Mm -hmm. so. Tell you the great thing about coming here, the great thing, the association that uh, we've been able to develop over the years uh, with the furniture study. The old one was uh, was fantastic. Um, that was downtown. Uh, you know that was great fun. Uh, you know basically this old, basically like this huge basement. Um, and I know I was worried when Eric was telling me about the, where they were going to move to and what the new space was gonna be. And I was kind of like, oh man, you know, it's not gonna be as easy to get to. Uh, and part of it, probably not downtown, so you can't go to the noodle restaurant that used to be across the street. Um, but 
when we came in here and uh, we were amazed. I mean, just the facility, everything about it, how open it is, um, was just an incredible, uh, an incredible thing. And to be able to um, come down, make an appointment, uh, study the stuff, uh, open drawers, bring students down, put together programs. I mean, we put together a program years ago with Pat Kane uh, with um, half a dozen card tables all upside down on tables so that we could see the construction. Um, and where else can you do that? I mean, I, I don't know any place where, where it's that accessible. So I would really tell you, come down to the furniture study, um, drive Eric crazy, and uh, you know, um, really be able to see some stuff and study some stuff. Excellent. So, yeah. well, thanks for telling yeah. us about the project. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric and Bob. And Bob, I think you could market that updated apothecary chest. I know um, I personally would like one for socks and tie storage. So um, I think you have a side business going. Talk to me. We can have it done in a couple months. Not a problem. Great. <laughs> we have a slew of questions. Um, I love an audience who is inquisitive. And um, boy, this group is. Uh, um, while everyone else is logging in additional questions using the Q&A feature, I was going to give my colleague Pat Kane first crack. So, Pat. Oh, thank you, John. Um, I have a question for Bob. Uh, Bob, you obviously um, worked on a piece um, that was based on uh, those that are documented or attributed to a life of Chapin, um, that legendary East Windsor, uh, Connecticut cabinet maker. And then you also did our desk on frame, which is generally called Chapin School. So it, uh, it kind of, I am assuming there are things about how it's made that aren't quite up to the tip top level of a life bullet. Um, so can you tell us one way in which it's um, construction or it's making uh, would indicate to you that it isn't uh, of the level of a life bullet? Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Um, I think the kind of the two, two things that stood out were the, um, the drawer layout. Um, and we felt that the, the drawer layout of the, like the shape and high chest, uh, where it's a wider center drawer, uh, and having, um, looked a little bit nicer and was more in keeping with uh, the, some of the other Chapin work. Uh, and then the more sculptural fan that, um, that we were talking about earlier uh, kind of led us to believe that too. But basically the, uh, you know, the, the Chapin school is on, the, on this, um, this desk on frame has been what it's, what it's always been referred to. And, um, uh, you know, by people who know a lot more than I do, so. Yeah, so it's those little finesses that um, really elevate the one and make this one be sort of the second tier, I'm gonna call it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So Gloria Bailey um, just says she loves this furniture and um, gives an acknowledgement to the talented students. And you really do have talented students. So um, just wanted to pass along that compliment. And many people are wondering, where did you source your wood? Uh, we, um, I buy from a, I buy from a company in, um, in uh, central Pennsylvania um, and buy all of the cherry there, a company called Erion. And they're, um, they're an amazing, amazing place. Uh, I don't go there. I have been dealing with um, Myron for so many years. I call him up and say, this is what I need. And they started out as furniture makers also. So they know if I'm looking for straight grain stock for styles and rails, that's what they're going to give me. Uh, a lot of the stuff that we did in the, um, in the in the class like all the drawers okay all the drawer the drawer fronts were all matched 
pieces. So we didn't just pick random pieces of cherry. All the drawer uh, fronts for a case came out of um, came out of match boards, uh, you know, which was really mm -hmm. important because then you then you have a continuity in color, continuity in grain, uh, and all that. So that, that's really important. And I got to say, the amount of work that we did milling and pre-milling and then finish milling all of the stock. I mean, just imagine. Uh, 16 high chest. That's a lot of cherry and that's a lot of pine. Yeah. Norwood Creech has a follow up question to this and wondered about um, the finishes you used. And especially because these are um, to be handled by the public, to be in these public spaces. And did you come up with any special waxes or what did you use for finishing? Uh, the finish was all just a, a simple wiping varnish uh, product called water locks, uh, you know, but a, a wiping varnish would have been, you know, somewhat appropriate. Uh, and it, you know, was a, a good, um, you know, just a really nice, uh, nice finish for this stuff. So, and it was all, you know, basically uh, uh, brushed and rubbed on and then, uh, and then uh, rubbed off. I personally was struck by the, um, some of the changes you made um, when recreating um, period furniture and, uh, and a few other people had similar questions uh, thinking about, um, you know, were you making an effort to use only historical techniques um, and are things like the drawer pulls, uh, for instance, on the apothecary chest, are those of period? So if you could talk about some of the, um, the changes you made, adaptations you made and your faithfulness to tradition. So yeah, that question has come up a couple times over the years and the when we measured these pieces, okay, we did not deviate at all from any of the original uh, original measurements. I mean, we were down to the hundredth of an inch, um, and the way pieces were put together, uh, you know, there were a couple a couple um, choices that had to be made uh, in in the um, you know build doing the uh, you know on the high chest. Uh, how did the quarter column go in and all that sort of thing. So there were a couple of different choices. Um, and Will and I, you know, we were looking in the in the uh, the high chest and basically he figured out uh, how the dividers worked on that, which is a little bit different from the usual, uh, much harder than the usual. Uh, and we we um, gave the class the choice. Do you want to go with the simpler, uh, more common way of doing it, or do you want to go with the way we think Chapin would have done it? And it was always the choice was always no. We're going with the hard, the, the way the harder way, uh, the way Chapin did it. And um, you know it was um, it was kind of fun, uh, you know, to be able to do that. The hardware, um, I know the hardware that we put on the high chest came, we searched all over and it actually came from um, Optimum Brass in England. Uh, you know, that was the, um, the only place that we could find that was really as close to the, what was on there um, that we could find. The stuff that was on the apothecary um, it was sourced from a couple different places. I mean, there there's only a couple places in the country that supply hardware of the kind of quality that we're talking about. Uh, you know, I can four or five at the most. Uh, it was interesting. Will actually made the catch on the glass door. Uh, you know, so that um, when you closed it, it stayed closed, but you couldn't. Um, break anything if you tried to open it without realizing that there was a catch on it. So it was pretty cool. Um, but you know, I don't have a picture or anything of it that you can see. Uh, so I hope that answers your question, John. Yeah. I mean, I, I think maybe one thing 
people are looking at is so like our original is bales uh -huh. on it and you chose to go with poles. But you know, those poles that you chose to go with, I mean they appear yeah. on, they appear on period pieces. So this is pretty much like what you chose to go with on the drawers. Yeah, I right? believe so. so yeah. yeah. So, you know, I mean I think obviously it's it was a, it was an existing option right. in the period. Right. I think your point about your observation that you had to get the brass from Britain is so wonderful because that's what was coming in the 18th century too. So some things really don't change. We still rely on British brasses. Um, someone was asking, point. and someone is asking um, if any of the furniture, uh, the, the other furniture in the house might have come from England or was everything locally made? Uh, we were looking at um, all the, the, like the breakfast table uh, in phase one, the breakfast table was uh, uh, Daniel, we, we studied the one that was made by Daniel Clay in, in the um, historic Deerfield, uh, and he worked out of the town next to Deerfield, uh, I don't remember the name, Pat, do you know what it is? I don't remember, Bob. Green. No. Greenfield. Oh, Greenfield. Greenfield. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, and and then the uh, the the tea table um, was a Chapin school also, uh, and uh, you know that was at CHS. So I'm not sure exactly where that was made. Yeah, but I don't think. I, I think generally in this time period, um, uh, and certainly in that place, um, that. The likelihood of there being British furniture in that house is very, very slim. Um, the British furniture that was owned historically in America tended to be very high end. In the early 18th century, many people had caned chairs and couches, couch being like a day bed, not a couch that we think of with lots of upholstery. Uh, and those were very popular among the well-to-do Americans. And um, I mean, we have some uh, 18th century um, um, chairs that were, you know, thought to be uh, English chairs that were thought to be here. But um, people, Americans who owned English furniture were, you know, few and far between and usually exceedingly wealthy. Um, so I think the houses that we're dealing with in Windsor, I'd be, I'd be amazed if there was any British furniture in those houses uh, originally. Yeah, I think the most extravagant thing in the, the probate inventory from 1819 is it does call out a mahogany desk, right? Is, right, because... but, but what, was, what, I, what we found interesting um, and a little bit demoralizing as a furniture maker uh, when we're looking at the inventory and, you know, we're looking at, you know, the breakfast tables, two breakfast tables, $6, uh, the desk, $12. Um, the 36 yards of ribbon that was uh, $20, $30, something like that. All of the textiles that was in the, in the um, inventory was way more valuable than the furniture that it was being put into. It was it was kind of like oh, um, huh, go figure. Yeah. <laughs> so it was it was interesting that way. Mm -hmm. That is ever so true, and you had a great example there in your photographs, and that was the bed. So yes. bed has this really simple little headboard. The, the bedstead, that is the wooden part that holds all the textiles, probably cost a tenth of all the textiles that were then used for the coverings and the curtains. And, and the beds were typically the most expensive thing in, in um, people's inventories right. because yeah. of the textiles. It was, it was so funny because I never realized that. And uh, Christina, she laughed and said, yeah, Bob, that's, that's the reality. The stuff you do, yeah, not very important, <laughs> but okay. So Eric mentioned um, this one reference to um, mahogany furniture, um, which is intriguing. And 
Um, at least two people have asked um, where the original wood was sourced. Um, so we know mahogany is coming out of the Caribbean, but the things like the cherry and the other materials, um, where would a cabinet maker be getting those the, the first time around? The mahogany, uh, Captain Howard uh, was a retired sea captain and he had a son in, um, in New York. So the mahogany probably came through him and, uh, and through, uh, you know, Captain Howard's uh, travels. Uh, the cherry and uh, pine, um, Pat, can you speak to that? I, I yeah. don't really know. I think there is lots of documentation that the cherry in this time period was coming out of New York State. It was being shipped down the Hudson and uh, was um, obviously traded up through the uh, Connecticut Valley. Uh, I know from my work on Rhode Island furniture that um, Rhode Island furniture makers um, were importing um, cherry from New York State. And so I think it was probably logged um, uh, someplace that had access, water access, no doubt, like down a river to the Hudson or towns close to the Hudson. I, I've kind of forgotten the specific details of the ports that it was shipped out of on the Hudson. But that I think is where most of it was coming from. People, people have this, um this idea in their mind that, uh, oh, 18th century furniture, the, the furniture makers going out uh, into the woods and he's cutting down trees and dragging them in and making furniture out of it. Um, and uh, no, <laughs> they, they bought it just like we do, okay? So. so one final question, which is for, I think all three of you, because it's a bit of a tricky question. Um, there is definitely interest in you know this feathered panel uh, backboard construction, and one um, attendee wants to know about dovetailed backboards. Have you ever seen? Do we know any dovetailed, dovetailed backboards? backboards? They they do exist. Uh, they're very rare, but I What's think that? they do exist, but they're very rare. I think you do find them in um, some New London County furniture. Okay. Um, I can't, I've never seen it, but I haven't studied nearly as much as Pat has. So I'm about to her. Wonderful. Now I'll, I'll hand it back to Eric. Yeah, well, I think um, I think we'll wrap things up. Uh, this was fascinating. Yeah, Bob. So, yeah, no, it was really good. Yeah, thanks a lot for coming. All right. And thank you to everybody for tuning in today. And um, and I'd also like to thank all my colleagues for all their help in making this program happen. Um, so please, um, you should see a link on your screen to the Furniture Studies webpage. So feel free to go to that and you can reach out to us to make an appointment. If you wanna come visit here during the week, we're open uh, Monday to Friday, nine to five. And I think we'll wrap it up. So thanks for tuning in and uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.